The aim of this work is to analyze the discourse about ethnic frontiers in early medieval England. I will focus on the relationship between the English people and the three ethnic groups that they most interacted, the Irish, the British and the Danes. I will begin from two texts, Bede's Ecclesiastica Historia against Zanglorum and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Therefore, I question how the ethnic frontiers are described in these sources. My main hypothesis is that the discourse about ethnic frontiers is an active element to the perception of otherness. The idea of ethnic group, appointed by the anthropologist Frederick Barth, is the main category to analyze frontiers. His propositions involve aspects of communication and cultural interactions, the settlement of unities, and the development of mechanisms to identify itself and the others. In reference to the idea of frontier, Elaine Treharne stated that the old English word board does not mean necessarily territorial or geographical limits. Although it does not appear in the two sources, the term is a tool to understand the fluidity of ethnic frontiers. Another main idea is the strategies of distinction, a concept by Walter Poe and Helmut Raymond. This element is important mainly because the discourse of frontiers is the written performance of these strategies in the range of political power, be it made in ecclesiastical grounds as far as royalty grounds. About the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a text written in Old English at the court of Alfred of Wessex, my main concern is the concept of Anglican. In Bede's Ecclesiastica Historia against Zanglorum, a text produced by Bede and finished in at 731, my aim is the concept of Gens Anglorum. These two concepts propose totalizing unities of the English in its discourse. Together, it creates an illusory idea of an English core. It is a challenge to visualize frontiers on them, but its own status of a discourse concerned with the definition of an unity suggests this possibility. The denying of the other described as selfless and non included, it is a clue uh, of ethnic frontiers in the discourse. In Ecclesiastica Historia against Zanglorum, the discourse of Bede about the Irish that he calls Scots against Scotorum admits the participation of Irish individuals inside the ecclesiastical circles of its people. The Irish were an active element for the idea of Gains Anglorum. The discussion about the Irish at E age appears in two main circles the Irish at Lindisfarne and the controversy of Easter. Regarding Lindisfarne, Bid is an admirer of the influence of Scots in its homeland. He admits that were Scots settled at the Kingdom of Northumbria, influencing the process of Christianization of the English. The divergences of the dating of Easter are a convenient mechanism to the proposition of differences in the ecclesiastical scope. Catherine Hughes has already said that it is impossible to understand the Celtic Church as a valid concept. It does not exist, indeed, an institution called Celtic Church, but Bede seems to connect ethnic distinction when defining the ecclesiastical differences. My reading is that these differences on data of Easter were a sign of ethnic frontiers. The strategies of distinction with the Irish are less noticeable than those of the Britons. The Irish appears as good neighbors justly by its influence in the process of Christianization of the English. This is evident when Bid refers to the three bishops that occupied seats at Lindisfarne. Aidan, for instance, gains proud wars by Bede for the producing of copies of the scriptures that he made, besides treat him in war manner by its wisdom. Finan, it is an ally, mainly because the conversion of King Pida of Mercia, sons of the famous King Penda, quotes him. So, Pida was baptized by Bishop Finan, together with all the Gathics and the Thanes who had come with him. On the other side, Coleman, while he was seen as an ally, he is described as a conservative that preserves its ethnic roots in the treatment of Easter, which Bede considers wrong, quoting, Coleman, in your observance of Easter, you neither follow the law or the gospel. Bede, therefore, does not concern in the limitized the Irish as a remote other, but offers a special place in the writing of a history of the English church. 
even that these descriptions of the Irish as pirates and looters, there were indicatives of how the ethnic frontiers with the Irish has different weights, mainly because those Irish inserted in the church were treated better. This is a piece that made specialists in these thematics, as the historian Sarah McCann, in the defining bit as an author very interested in ethnic identities. McCann is precise when the limits the participation of Irish individuals in the Ecclesiastica Historia, but my vision is that this interest is a condition to the existence of strategies of distinction of the own Irish when beat draw the frontiers between the Gains Anglorum and the Gains Cotorum. For the Britons, there were a rather different discourse. Unlike the virtuous Irish, Bede develops a much more unfavorable narrative. In the first book, the Britons were assigned for the initial failure of the English evangelization, quoting, that they never preached the faith to the Saxons or the Angles who inhabited Britain with them. He also describes the military clashes between the Britons and the English, being an enthusiast of the English onslaught upon the Britons and their refugee to the west part of the British island. In certain portraits, he conceives heroes that were heroes only for the account of fights against Britons. One of these was Ethelfif of Northumbria. He was portrayed as, quoting, a very brave king and most eager for glory, was ruling over the king of Northumbria. He ravaged the Britons more extensively than any other English ruler. Unlike the Irish that were seen as heterogeneous, the Northumbrian monk appeals to a narrative of homogenization of the British people, not determining its political unities. The opponents of Ethelfrith were simply Britons. Regarding the ecclesiastical circles, T.M. Charles Edwards had proposed an interesting approach that suggests that Bede describes the Britons as erratics and schismatics. For instance, such a perspective appears in the narrative about the participation of Shad, probably a British bishop, at the English ecclesiastical circles. From there unfolds an even more aggressive narrative. The Irish even that were wrong in the dating of Easter, were not seen as heretics. There were Britons, sometimes described as maintainers of the Roman Easter, quoting, Two bishops of the British race who has repeatedly been said keep Easter Sunday. Nonetheless, the dating of Easter does not influence the descriptions of the British as heretics and schismatics. Thus, it creates a very particular perspective, be it while Bill's subtler frontiers with the Irish had created an intermediary antagonist due to the non evangelization of the Gains Anglorum. The discourse of adding frontiers of Bid about the Britons certainly exposed dualities. Regarding the Danes, the construction of antagonism is much more sharp. In the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it is perceptible that the Danes polarize the ethnic discourse for the formation of Anglican, starting with an atypical narrative on the arrival with their plunder at Lindisfarne at 793 entry. Besides the mentions of sentences like those of fear dragons across the firmament, it is here where starts the most recurrent term that forms ethnic frontiers with the Danes, the Old English heathen. Especially in the Northumbrian entries, this term is more pronounced, probably in function of an intenser presence of the Danes in the territory. My view is that this terminology establishes a relation of otherness because hasten is an indicative of an unknown other in the religious frontiers. This coefficient of a religious antagonism had its boiling point at Alfred's reign, in which constitutes one of the pillars for the detachment of its political power through Anglican from the territory dominated by the Danes. The Anglican, as suggested by Sarah Foot, exercised influence in the process of the making of England. At Egbert's reign, the frontiers were an important element to describe the king as one of the Great Walders. As already said by Patrick Wormout, this terminology is a redefinition of Imperium that bid concerns to delimitate the kings that had reached. Wormout yet suggests that the Great Walder can be detached from the point of view of a governance title. My view is that Bretwalda, when placed alongside with otherness, provides a reinterpretation between the relations of power and frontier. On evidence can be seen at MSC, 
where the word is spelled as Breton Wald, which Wald means power, and Breton is probably a derivative word for the Britons. While the Britons were described as a subdued other integrated to the political unity of Wessex, the Danes, at least in the 9th century, were so antagonist that it contributed to the maintenance of power from Egbert. It was right after the entry of 828 that were described the first plunders of the heathen men, still in Egbert's reign. Regardless if it has a subjugation or interrogation of the other, yet appears side by side. An evidence is set at 838 when the forces of Egbert were described as winners of a battle against the Britons and the Danes at Hensington Dawn. At the 10th century, however, the descriptions start to clothe with other garments. The set of the Dane law removes the charge of antagonism. The Danes, still imbued with ethnic differences, were aware of a process of hybridism with the English, as indicated by the PhD thesis of Isabella Buquerque. The territorial set of Dane law was a landmark for the creation of ethnic borders, not just frontiers. There were fluid frontiers, constituting proper space of interactions between ethnicities. In the religious field, the own description of the Danes through labels of heathen men creates very sharp differences about the feeling of religiosity. Unlike the Britons and the Irish, which are Christians, the Danes, while being pagans, carried out an exclusively label. The frontiers here had particular strategies of distinction for the context. In this work, I have looked to expose the proximity between otherness and ethnic frontiers in the discourse of Pitt and the Chronicle. As I already said, each frontier has its own particularity. While Beat admits the performance of Irish individuals in the context of Gains and Glorum, the Britons were relegated as an foreign order. Beat allows the participation of the Irish in the Christianization of his homeland, from the description of monks from Iona at Lindisfarne. From the other side, referring to Britons, Bid appoints with resentment their absence in the Christianization process, creating oppositions. In the Alfred Anglican, the descriptions about the Danes raises the religious antagonists to an even higher degree. Their label of pagans in the Chronicle shows how the strategies of distinction were enhanced and thus much more proeminent. After this quick lecture, I can appoint similarities between ethnic frontiers. What is more central is that Beef and the Chronicle were concerned with otherness, an otherness clothed with different costumes, but that carries some precepts that can be validated in the discourse of ethnic frontiers. It is in the discourse analysis about ethnic frontiers that I can indicate agents in a historical process guided by the otherness, otherness that exists with its own coefficients, propers and particulars, as an overweight element in a process of ethnic formation, an otherness that shapes and modifies the discourse about ethnic frontiers in early medieval England. Thank you.